first scripture reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 43, from verse 9 to verse 13. I read from the NIV. Shall we listen to the word of God? All the nations gather together, and the peoples assemble. Which of them foretold this, and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was found, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And apart from me, there is no savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I, and not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, from the ancient days, I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? This is the word of the Lord. Our second Bible reading is taken from 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 to 12. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 to 12. I read from the New International Version. Let us hear the word of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony. But God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. Whoever believes in the son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe, God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is the word of God. Shall we pray? Sovereign Lord, we thank you for the privilege to gather in your presence. Jesus, Son of God. Sweet, glorious Holy Spirit, we thank you for this morning. Please speak to our hearts and help us not only to hear but also to understand and obey it to the glory of your name. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, I worked with a junior colleague who was hardworking and knowledgeable about her role. I was the head of department. One Saturday morning, we spoke on phone and she informed me she was in the office working. Probably she was there to meet a deadline. Occasionally though, I wondered whether she was out to really support or merely to impress me. Monday morning, after the usual good mornings, I asked her if she was at work on Saturday. Yes, she replied confidently. I told you that on Saturday, didn't I? She reminded me. I asked her in my broad gun accent, are you sure? Yes, she stressed. I looked at her face as she spoke. I even took note of her makeup and recognized that it appeared she was two shades of her natural complexion. It was her word against the expressionless look I wore. I called two other members of the team who confirmed they were also in the office on Saturday. 
Then I asked them in her presence to confirm where I was on Saturday. They both confirmed that I was in the office with them. Beloved, when I spoke to the lady that Saturday morning, I was in the office, standing by her vacant desk. I can still feel the silence of her desk that Saturday morning. It was the testimonies of the two witnesses I called that helped to resolve the matter. This morning, we will discuss God's testimony, the key to our faith. The word group, testimony, testimonies, testified, and their kind together appear eight times in our short text this morning. In the original Greek, it actually appears ten times. Our focus is this. It is what God himself has said as testimony about Jesus Christ to serve as evidence to help us in our faith and our conduct. This is what we are looking at this morning. Properly explained, faith is an evidence-based phenomenon. As Reverend Bama taught us last week, our faith should not be in faith. Our faith should be in Jesus, who existed in history and lends himself to evidence-based considerations. And that is what we are going to look at this morning. By way of structure, this sermon will be in two parts. I encourage you to follow closely because there will be some detail along the line as we go along. First, we will see three streams of evidence or testimony that prove that Jesus is the Son of God. The second part will see us trying to unpack what it feels like a capsule of the entire testimony of God. So two parts. Let's begin with the first part, the three streams of testimony. Let us go to 1 John chapter 5 and look at the very last verse on which we ended last week when our senior pastor taught us. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So there's a link between last week's sermon and this week's. Last week, we looked at faith, the key to overcoming. Faith as the key to overcoming. The question now is, what is the basis for that faith? And this morning we are saying, God's testimony is the key to that faith. In other words, it is what God himself has said that serves as the basis for our faith. And that faith in Jesus now enables us and equips us to overcome the evil systems of this world and of the evil one. When we say Jesus is the Son of God, what does it mean? Before I tell you what it means, let me tell you what it does not mean. It does not mean that God said, I do, and then had a child. God did not have a wife. It means Jesus is God who became human to save us from our sins, for God's glory. When you hear the scripture that says, the word became flesh, that is what it means. Now, who is this son of God? And that is where verse 6 begins. And that is where our text for today starts from. Verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood. And the Spirit testifies concerning them. So that is the starting point for our, our sermon this morning. The water and blood are clearly symbols. And what they mean has been subjected to a lot of debate by theologians. My reading of the text and my understanding of it happens to coincide with what most evangelical theologians hold. So that is what I'll share with us this morning. It is this. The water is symbolic of Jesus' baptism and the blood of his death. So it is symbolic. So we're going to look at these three streams of evidence. First, the water, and then the blood, 
and then the Spirit, to see how all three of them confirm the sonship of Jesus Christ. There will be some dense considerations, but God will help us. So the first one, first stream, water. John the Baptist came as the forerunner to the Messiah, the Son of God. A forerunner is someone who precedes another. The Messiah is a long-awaited Savior. Now, when John was baptizing Jesus, something happened. And I want us to see that in Mark chapter 1, from 10 to 11. Mark 1, 10 to 11. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. That was God the Father speaking, testifying that Jesus is the Son of God. Catch the drama of it. Someone is being baptized. People are dipped in water. They come out. And then the next person comes. They go to, it got to this one person. And then it is like the heavens were torn into. The Holy Spirit descends as a dove, and a voice speaks from heaven, saying, this is my son. If you, in spite of this event in history, say Jesus is not the son of God, you don't know what sort of person are you. See what John again had to say in John chapter 1, verse 33 to 34. John 1, 33, 34. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then he says, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. So this is how the water or the baptism helps us to understand that Jesus is the Son of God. That is the first stream under the first part. Let's now go to the second stream, which is the blood, symbolically referring to the death of Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus declares him to be the Son of God. And there are many verses that make the point, and I will quote just two of them. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus Christ was not a lamb. On earth he was God-man. He was not an animal. The language is figurative. Only a sinless lamb who satisfy God's righteous anger against sin. And Jesus is that lamb without blemish or defect. Here is a second scripture. And it is Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, saying about Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The one who had no sin must be fully God because all have sinned, all. So the one who is without sin must be God. There are some professing Christians who find the doctrine of the death of Christ abominable and are pushing for a Christianity devoid of the cross. They argue that a father killing his son is a formula for child abuse. So there actually was a conference held somewhere in the US and one speaker by name, Dolores Williams, is quoted to have said, I don't think we need a theory of atonement at all. I don't think we need folks hanging on crosses and blood dripping and weird stuff. We just need to listen to the God within. Thankfully, that was his view Others go ahead to say, no, the real God is Sophia, wisdom. And not all these 
mangled body on a wooden structure with blood dripping. But that was his view. If I may ask, what is your view? Do you think the cross of Christ is credible? Have you satisfied yourself by searching the scriptures and material from history to satisfy yourself that indeed Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that the blood confirms him as the Son of God? The cross is a testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. That brings us to the end of the second stream. So what have we done so far? We said the sermon will be in two parts. We are in the first part. In the first part, we have three streams. We've done water and blood. Let's go now to the third stream, which is the Spirit. Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 15 and verse 26. John chapter 15, verse 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So the Holy Spirit testifies about who Jesus Christ is. May I ask a question, please? And I think I may call somebody to answer this. So let's see. Okay, now let's go. Why did God send the Holy Spirit to earth to bear witness about Jesus? Why? There are many reasons why. Here is one of them. So that the Holy Spirit will stir the hearts of humans to enable us to believe in Jesus for our salvation. God has a plan for salvation. Humans have sinned and are dead in their transgressions. The Holy Spirit is on earth to, among other things, stir up our hearts and convict us so that we can respond to the gospel. How does he do that? Let's read from John chapter 16. 7 to 11. It's relatively long, but I think we should read it. John chapter 16 from 7 to 11. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Verse 8. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Take note of these. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The message actually says that he would convict them about sin because it is the most basic error, the most basic challenge that we have. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing in the hearts of non-Christians. And we all were once non-Christian if uh, we are Christian. And for those of you who are not born again yet, this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your heart even now. He's saying your fundamental issue is that you have not believed in Jesus Christ. That is your biggest issue on earth. For that reason, you have two options. Righteousness, believe in Jesus Christ so you'll be saved, or judgment. Satan, as he has been condemned, so will judgment await all who don't believe in Jesus Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing in the hearts of non-Christians. Sin, righteousness, judgment. Sin, righteousness, judgment. And it is all about Christ. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you are sinning. This can only be that Jesus is the Son of God. How does he minister or testify in the lives of Christians? There are many scriptures. Here are a few. 1 Corinthians 3.16 teaches us that he lives in the Christian. And he teaches the Christian about Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter 14 and verse 26. John chapter 14 verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So all that Jesus Christ has taught, the Holy Spirit is here to draw our minds to it. As if to say, you don't live by living on Daily Graphic or City FM or Joy FM or your textbooks, although there's nothing wrong with all of these. But the most important consideration is that our hearts and minds will be drawn 
to all that Jesus Christ has taught so that we would live to honor him and please him. The next thing he does is what we find in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. And this is a very important ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. He bears witness in the hearts of Christians that we are ch children of God. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So this is how it works. We place our faith in Jesus Christ. We believe we are saved. But there are times when difficulties come. And you are like, hey. Could it be that this born again thing, maybe it is fake? If Christ is real, how come I'm having all these difficulties? Then you go on your knees and as you pray, as you have your quiet time, as you come to church, somewhere in the depths of your heart, you know that you know that you know that although there are questions you don't have answers to, you are assured of this one thing that it is enough that Jesus Christ died to save you. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. There's a lot more we can say, but we'll end here. So what have we done so far? We have come to the end of the first part of the sermon, looking at the three streams of evidences, water, which is baptism, blood, his death, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Three sources of witnesses, as if to say it is satisfying the requirement of the law. That says, by the words of two or three witnesses, a word is established. So, to Jewish readers and all who knew the law, this satisfies the matter. There are varied sources of witnesses all confirming this one point, that Jesus is the Son of God. Let us now go to the second part of our sermon, which is God's testimony. We want to unpack as presented God's testimony. Look at verses 11 and 12 of our text for today. Verse 11. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. It is impossible, well, it is difficult for me to see how you can read a text like this or hear it or encounter it and still say you will not give your life to Jesus Christ. Because there is the biological life that we have. Animals to have it. It is the vitality and the energy that keeps us going. But there is something called eternal life. That one, you don't get it because you came out of the maternity ward. You don't get it because you know biology or physics or chemistry. That one, it is in only Jesus Christ. And those who place their trust in Jesus Christ, they are the only ones who have it. And this morning, you have the privilege and the opportunity to receive this eternal life. Let me read the text again. And this is the testimony. It is the testimony of God, not of man. Not the two witnesses I called in my office that Monday morning. This is the testimony of God himself, the one who spoke from the skies when Jesus Christ was baptized. He said, this is his testimony. God has given us eternal life. And where can this life be found? Where is it? And this life, and this life is in his son. So, you don't have eternal life if you don't have Jesus Christ. Oh, you can come to church. You can preach like I'm doing. You can sing in the choir and be a Sunday school teacher. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you don't have this eternal life that we are discussing this morning. And this morning, I want to plead with you by the mercies of God. Don't live here not having this eternal life. I want to draw your attention to a few points about the testimonies as we see it in the scriptures and what lessons we can learn. A testimony is important and generally we accept it as part of life. Like what happened that Monday morning in my office? Even in our own lives, there are times when you say, are you sure? Did it happen? Then you call someone and say, Were you there? Oh, say, yes, I was there. You want to get married? 
Have you gone through counseling? Yes. What shows? Then you bring your paper where all the counselors have signed. That is, it testifies that you have done the right thing. So, testimonies are part of life. And this is what the verse says. Look at verse 9. We accept human testimony. The text is saying, we accept human testimony, don't we? In, 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 in court, we accept the testimonies of men. We believe our friends and family and business associates when they tell us stuff about others. If I may, because testimonies are important and they can actually lead to people getting into trouble, we want to be careful what we say, even what we post on social media about people. Make it a point not to bear false witness because a wrong testimony is like bearing false witness. The scriptures teach us in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. The consequences can be grave. Our Old Testament reading has a point for us in Isaiah 43 and verse 10. God required his people, Israel, to be witnesses, telling others about him and what he had done for them. So testimonies about Christ actually emanate from God, and we now have the privilege of re-echoing it. We re-echo it. That is all we are supposed to do. The truth is that people do not see God because God is spirit, but they see and hear us who have been transformed by him. So our words and our lives may either attract people to Christ or repel them. Properly explained, the testimony about Christ is really God's testimony, and we have the privilege of just re-echoing it. Let us not create testimonies that are not aligned with scripture. You know, there's a literary device called pun, P-U-N, pun. So at times you write and say, oh, pun unintended. But at times we intend the pun. So let me try pun, P-U-N. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. With my broad Ghana accent. Who Jesus is, is God's own testimony. It is Jehovah's own witness. So if you and I have to be Jehovah's witnesses, we have to re-echo what Jehovah has said and taught in the Bible and not what we think or imagine or manufacture. Pun intended. Jesus is the son of God, and that means all that God the Father is, God the Son is. Full stop. The scriptures are clear. Second point about testimonies. A testimony, no matter how you put it, would generally fall in two broad categories. It is either the testimony of man or the testimony of God. And that is what we see in verse 9. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater. The testimony of God is more important because humans don't know everything. And the motives are not always even right. They may lie. They may be wrong. But God is infinitely credible. And his testimony is infinitely greater than that of humans. In the context in which John was writing, it appeared there were different testimonies about Christ. And you encounter this a lot in the Pauline epistles. Wrong teachings, and many of them are repeating today in our world in various shapes and forms. Some of them denied the Son. They denied Jesus Christ and did not accept him. You see that in chapter 2 and verse 23 of our text, which means that there must be some other means of salvation. But God says, no, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. It is through him that we have eternal life. Others deny Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. In other words, they accept that Christ is God or you know, he's some deity, but power that God became man and had need for breast milk and cocoa. No, 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 no. They couldn't accept that. So they denied that he had come in the flesh. You see that in chapter 4 and verse 2 of 1 John. And that undermines the salvation plan of God because he, had, he came, he was tempted in every way, he identified with us, and then he could take our sins on himself and die. The rest denied that Jesus is the Christ. So they, they couldn't see how the man was walking on earth, he could be tired, 
perhaps his clothing has to be washed at a point. Now you are saying he is the Christ, the Messiah, God. No, it couldn't be. So they were having all these difficulties, which would mean that his death could not have satisfied the righteous requirements of God. So John steps out and holds all their testimonies against the light of the gospel, the testimony of God himself. And this is a very effective approach for living. I want to recommend it to us. No matter what arguments you struggle with, go to the Bible, trust God the Holy Spirit to help you to find out what do the scriptures say. All the positions we hold should be theologically sound and Christologically centered. In fact, the Bible, you can actually get lost in it. So as you go through, if you are kind of having difficulties, ask yourself, what has God done through Christ and what does it mean? It often, it may not help you to answer every question, but it will break down many of the difficult issues that we have about Christian doctrine. It is helpful to be particularly Christological and then side with God. Who Jesus is, is not open to negotiation because God himself declared him to be his son. The next point I want to raise about testimony as we see in our text is that God's testimony dwells in the heart of the Christian. And I want us to read verse 10 from the NLT, 1 John 5 verse 10. It says, anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Properly explained, this refers to the testimony of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. As I mentioned earlier in Romans 8:16, he gives the believer the assurance that he's a child of God. And in Ephesians chapter 1, we read that he is the seal that guarantees our salvation. 1 John 4:13. Important one to read. 1 John 4 and verse 13. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Reflect on this once again. We know that we live in him and he in us. How does Christ live in us? If you dissect a Christian, you won't see Christ there. You see organs, you know. But we know Christ is in us because he has given us his spirit. So he indwells us by the agency of the glorious and powerful Holy Spirit of God. What a privilege that God will consider mere mortals his abode. Next point we can learn about the testimony of God in our text is that some people reject God's testimony that Jesus is the son of God. And by so doing, they make God a liar. Some people reject him. Look at verse 10. Whoever believes in the son of God accepts this testimony. 1 John 5 verse 10. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. This is a grievous matter. That God would say, this is my position on the matter, and then you say, I don't accept it. When, you, when we do so, we are saying God is a liar. The testimonies from God about Jesus are many in the, in the, in the Bible, and I want to touch on some of them so that we can study them and be convinced of the basis of the faith that we have. Jesus, as the Son of God, is not the fabrication of the church. It is the clear teaching of the Bible. And so we hold on to it and we order our lives by it. We have the testimony of his birth. Jesus was born of a virgin. Church, think about it once again. How can a virgin be with child? Whenever... The, uh, Somebody takes seed, you know, you go for a wedding, you see a young couple, not me too, I can see a couple is young, you know. You see a young couple, eh, prayer ministry and Bible study, and you're like, hey, Charlie, so these people, the way they pray, can they? You know. And then 
she's pregnant, she's married. Now, who is not an issue? Because she's married. How is not an issue? For being child for Lanyami. So when a virgin says she's with child, mm, that is what happened. So it was the Holy Spirit himself who planted the baby in Mary's womb. If this does not make Jesus interesting to you for your eternity, I don't know what else. Here is another testimony. We have the testimony of his life and teaching and the profound impact he had on people. Unschooled men who followed him virtually took the world by storm. When Jesus was leaving, the 12 disciples, they were not, they didn't have degrees. I tell you, if they were here, they would have needed translation for what you are saying, properly explained. On account of their engagement with Christ, they took the world by storm. We have the testimony of his miracles. He raised the dead. Pause and reflect on this once again. There's one story in the Bible that when it comes to Jesus' miracles, it's kind of like, whew. There's a story in Luke where uh, there was a funeral procession and a widow's only child was going to be buried. Now, a, a, a widow in those days would have been a challenged person, economically speaking, and so on and so forth. Now, your only son, the only son of a widow, typically they'll call him junior. You know, because you have to keep the memory of the father alive. Then that child also dies. So they were going to the cemetery to bury the child. I wasn't there, but I can imagine the wailing and the pain and the hurt. Then Jesus appears on the scene. Ha! Look, Jesus, you show boy. <laughs> what? That is the cause. And the boy is brought to life. And these are not fabrications of 21st century Legon inhabiting people. These are accounts recorded in history in the same way that we have the walls of China and the ancient cities of Babylon. It is a historical account. You can have evidences outside of the Bible. And you still you say, Jesus doesn't mean much to you. Don't live here not having accepted Christ into your heart because you will be making God a liar. We have the testimony of the water, the baptism, which we've touched on already. We have the testimony of the blood, which we have talked about already. Hey, think about it. Jesus died and rose again. <laughs> Maybe we read it so much, we don't even take time to reflect on it. He died. He died. They rolled a stone over the tomb. And people went home sad. Their whole hopes were dashed. The songwriter says, they won. The devil thought he had won. Day two, death lost its mystery. Day three, Jesus made history by rising from the dead with a mighty victory, with the keys of death and Hades in his hands. Say, hey, 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 who are we talking about? You want to know his name? Let me tell you about it wouldn't continue from here because then we spell his name J-E-S-U-S -S, and stuff like that. Jesus he, he, he did form. And we have the testimony of hundreds of prophecies fulfilled in him. Today people prophesy who would win the football match and when the, the, when the prophecy doesn't come to pass then they now want to find where the, probability two, two football, two teams are playing he said, I win or lose or draw. Even that one, they struggle. Hundreds of prophecies were fulfilled in Christ. Hey, don't live here not accepting Christ. Don't. Because God has given us eternal life. And this life, not the biological one that takes you to the hospital and the doctor can check and say, oh, you have this infection. The eternal life is not biological. It is the life of God himself. The life as God intended it. Which today we see corrupted. That life... It's what we are talking about here. When Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, the way when you are hungry, you eat bread and you are satisfied. That is the kind of life. That's the imagery for it. It is called eternal life. Eternal life. When you know God and you know his son, you have eternal life. Anyone who does not believe all these is saying they are lies and that makes God a liar. 
Respectfully, let me put it this way. If you say God is a liar, then perhaps you are a living lie. I'll explain. If you have somebody who does 419, he's an artist, he does 419. If he brings you an artwork, you know that all oh, this thing is fake. Because the artist is fake. If you have a student who is known to have no credibility, when he hands in an assignment, you say, okay, I, I like this hard copy. Send me the soft copy. So that you can go and check if he's doing what bad students do. So if the source be wrong, the product will be wrong. If the reactants are improper and the conditions for the reaction are improper, the product would necessarily be wrong. So if you say God, your maker, is a liar, then you are a lie. But because you are alive, you are a living lie. And if I say so, I'm also a living lie. Because God made us, if you don't believe in him, then you are fake. John chapter 3, verse 36. See what the scriptures say. John chapter 3, verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains in him. Whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains in him. This eternal life, it is a gift that comes only through Christ. It does not come because we exercise regularly and we walk up the Bree Mountain regularly. That is biological. This eternal life, it comes from God through Christ alone. That requirement is both exclusive and exhaustive. Exclusive in the sense that it is only through Christ and yet exhaustive in the sense that when you accept Christ, you have the entire package of all the blessings that are in Christ. Final point. God's testimony is simple and clear. What is there to explain again from verse 11? God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Choose this day whether you will accept Jesus and live or reject him and have no life. It is certain that we all want to live forever. And properly explained, we will live forever. But the question is, where would you live? Because as for the grave, it is certain. We all know there's a grave. But beyond that, where? It depends on where you live. Life in the world filled with difficulties and health challenges like ours will not be great. God is the creator of life. Listen to this, John chapter 5, verse 26. John chapter 5 and verse 26. Very beautiful verse. I want to read this one for us. So that we can understand the peculiar place of Christ in God's plan. For us, the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. As the Father, so the Son. Why Jesus? It is because Jesus is the only one who is righteous enough to stand before God and plead on our behalf. He's the only one. That is why he calls him his beloved Son. He is the only means to salvation. And this morning, I plead with you, don't leave here having checked the box for attending church, but not having Christ in your heart. Okay, so what have we done so far? We've looked at God's testimony as the key to our faith. In two parts, we've looked at three streams of evidence that prove that Jesus is the Son of God. Water, baptism, blood, his death, and the Spirit's witness. And we have sought to unpack the truth of God's word, God's testimony. Do you believe God's word or you believe the preface in your textbook? Do you believe God's word that you have heard this morning that says that Jesus is the only means to salvation or you want to leave it? Everyone who is a Christian some time ago gave his life to Christ and I want to encourage you and plead with you to give your life to this Jesus Christ. Cast your faith in him and ask him to forgive you your sins so you will have this eternal life 
that we are talking about. Shall we pray? I want to encourage you to pray, talk to God. I want to encourage you to talk to God and say, thank you for helping me to hear your word. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I want to invite Jesus into my heart. What I didn't emphasize is that the Holy Spirit convicts us about sin and righteousness and judgment. This morning, do you want to accept Christ into your heart? Do you really want to? If you want to, go ahead and talk to him. Go ahead and talk to him so you don't escape this eternal life. And if you are saved, you want to pray for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the heart of the unsaved. Go ahead and talk to him. I want to give you the opportunity to give your life to Christ. If you want to really give your life to Christ this morning, please stand up wherever you are. Don't be ashamed so that we can pray with you and help you to grow. Stand up this morning and come and receive, in, uh, receive this life. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Rise to your feet this morning so we can pray with you. Rise to your feet. Stand up. Stand up. Don't be ashamed. Stand up so we can give. We can help you to, to come to faith in Jesus Christ. I hear that welcome voice, if we can do that. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ this morning? Please turn to your feet so that we can pray with you. Don't be ashamed. Are you ready to receive eternal life or you want it to pass it by? Come for life, come for life. Come for salvation in Jesus Christ. Come for life. Don't be ashamed. Rise to your feet. If you want to give your life to Christ, stand up this time. Let's pray with you. closing. Father, thank you for your word. Grant us grace to walk in this eternal life that you have blessed us with for the glory of your name. Thank you so much for the gift of Christ Jesus who died to save us from our sins. May your name be forever praised and may we be living testimonies of your goodness. Amen. Appreciate you joining our service today. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking on the logo and don't forget to like and share. See you next week. God bless you.